Today, uh, I would like to speak to you about the conversation of philanthropy. Philanthropy, which means generosity. And I suspect that if you're like me or the majority of people in our larger culture, when we think about philanthropy, we think about people who have so much. What does philanthropy mean? It's benevolence. It's social conscience, it's humanity and kindness, all words we kind of feel good about, right? Hello and welcome to Left Out. Before we get into the session, a little bit about ourselves. My name is Michael Palmieri. I'm a graduate of the Milano School for International Affairs at the New School University. And I'm Dante Dallavalli. I'm a recent graduate of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities at Montclair State University. Left Out is brought to you by Democracy at Work, an economic justice organization that strives to advocate for alternative solutions to the current model of capitalism. To get a better understanding of what we do, Visit our websites, democracyatwork.info and rdwolf, with two Fs, dot com. So throughout recent years, there's been a lot of boasting about the progress made throughout poverty-stricken areas of the world. And at the center of this conversation is the role played by philanthropic organizations. This episode's gonna highlight the problems that come from such large-scale giving and what it means for democracy. Okay, so with that, where I think we should start um, is why do we have philanthropy in the first in the first place? Why do we? Well, we can get past the mushy feel good part of all of it, and then actually get to the fundamental economic and theoretical reasons as to why it's so popular and supported. So the main idea that underpins the argument for philanthropy today is well, let's go to the man himself. There are some very important problems. This is Bill Gates at a 2009 TED athletes. conference. That is, the market does not drive the scientists, the communicators, the thinkers, the governments to do the right things. And only by paying attention to these things and having brilliant people who care and draw other people in can we make as much progress as we need to. Bob Buckley, a senior fellow at the New School and once managing director of the Rockefeller Foundation, reiterated the point to me in an email. He said, of course the government should redistribute some, but well-functioning philanthropies can outdo governments in targeting issues beyond the social safety net. And we can call this the pluralism argument. Yeah. And it's the belief that foundations can help to diminish government orthodoxy by decentralizing the definition and distribution of public goods. This in turn makes space for multiple perspectives, kind of a competitive marketplace in dealing with public goods. It's not limited by government policy, which is often viewed as some monolithic perspective. I think also in addition, the argument goes is that it also allows the targeting of individuals that the market would otherwise ignore. Mm. Pretty convincing. Yeah, right? It's, it's interesting because from a philosophical perspective. That's Lindsay McGoy. She teaches sociology at the University of Essex and recently published a book titled No Such Thing as a Free Gift, The Gates Foundation and the Price of Philanthropy. The, the less regulation that you have, in theory, you'll lead to more of a plurality of voices and actors. But in practice, you have the same problem that often hits economic markets, which is some strong competitors go on to become monopolistic forces. And they actually exert a lot of directional influence on the policies that are taken up and adopted by grantees, on the initiatives that are spearheaded by government bodies, because size and clout and monetary power buys influence. And when you're influencing policy in a certain direction, there's an incentive for grantees to follow the money. So actually, counter to the expectation of philosophy, you've got a narrowing of choice rather than an expansion of choice. And just like you occasionally need antitrust regulations to come in and break up, say, large court cartels or monopolies, you actually need a regulatory policy or intervention to insist that no one foundation gets problematically large. 
So it's with that point in mind that we asked ourselves, how should we be responding to the report issued by Giving USA, an organization that tracks the philanthropy sector in the US, which estimated that, get this, $359 billion was given in the year 2014, and that's by far the largest amount ever recorded. We began with David Callahan. Yeah, I'm David Callahan. I'm the founder and editor of Inside Philanthropy, a digital media site covering the world of philanthropy. We asked Mr. Callahan about the report. Well, it's a, it's a mixed bag. On the one hand, it's great that so many people, so many wealthy people care about making society a better place. Uh, on the other hand, you know, these are people who are exercising a lot of power in our society and their money can be disruptive at times. And education is a great example of that. And there's just so many examples of how disruptive big money can be and has been in education. Here's just a few. The Koch brothers' philanthropic endeavors, especially the donations to higher education, have enabled the brothers and their foundations to craft curricula, hire and fund teachers, and assign chairs and directors to departments and programs that express their ideology. The University of Florida being a case in point. And you know, there's also best friends of the Kochs, James R. Pope, as another example, he's a conservative multimillionaire, and he's a founding board member of the Koch Foundation Americans for Prosperity. His generous grants to the University of North Carolina earned him a seat on influential boards, as, as well as influence in the political science department of North Carolina State University. But it doesn't just go down the ideological divide, right? There's also Mark Zuckerberg's 2010 donation of $100 million to Newark Public Schools, attempting to make Newark a quote-unquote model city for education reform. A book recently published by Dale Russikoff titled The Prize, Who's in Charge of America's Schools, demonstrates how the initiative completely ignored the wider community's demands and then ultimately failed. For anyone interested in this subject, it's a great read. There's two broader issues here. The first is that we see curriculum being controlled by individuals in a university setting. And in university settings, it should really be a place of creativity, free thought, and exploration, and that's being stifled by these big dollars, right? Absolutely. And the second point, and what former Assistant Secretary of Education, Diane Ravitch, points out, is that there's a particular agenda that's being followed by some of the biggest philanthropic organizations across the line. And such policies include, you know, privatization efforts, such as charter schools, undermining tenured teachers' collective bargaining rights, that is, attacking unions, and evaluating teachers according to their students' test scores. And this really amounts to a complete overhaul of the relationships between the community, between the teachers of schools and students. I mean, Dante, I, I think you raise some really good points. Two of them, though different in substance, I think demonstrate a particular and fundamental problem of philanthropy, which is its narrow scope that fails to enact structural change. Mm. Right. I think that there are, are a lot of education funders who are trying to fix schools and improve teaching and raise student achievement. And so often those funders don't look at what's happening outside of schools, which is that many children are growing up in poverty. Often they're coming from pretty chaotic households and, you know, unstable living situations and and they're not so prepared to learn and that if philanthropy only focuses at the school level and doesn't pay attention to what's happening outside of schools, it's probably not going to make that big of a dent in the low student achievement uh, by so many young people. McGoy agreed. Education is the second highest sector in receipt of philanthropic funds after religions, and there's many reasons why, especially the way that recent giving trends are actually encouraging for-profit uh, profiteering from the education field, this is a worry that's leading some to su suggest that philanthropic giving in this area is only exacerbating a widening outcomes between wealthier students and poorer ones. For whatever reasons, this, this increase in giving to education institutes is not making a dent in the main problem that's shown to be one of the major, major causes of different outcomes between wealthy and poor families, which is poverty itself. I think it's an appropriate time for us to just jump back and look at poverty in a global sense. Mm -hmm. For example, there's the recent report that Oxfam uh, had just put out, an economy for the 1%. 
It pointed out that since 2010, the bottom 50% of the world's population has lost 38% of its wealth, while the richest 62 individuals, owning more than the bottom half of the world's population, have increased their share of wealth by 45%. It was numbers like these that forced us to ask about philanthropy's relationship to inequality, not only in economic, but also political terms. Yeah, Professor Lindsay McGoy lent her thoughts on economic inequality and philanthropy. There has been surprisingly little work from a from a macroeconomic perspective on trying to understand the correlation between increased philanthropy and growing inequality. So this is something that's difficult to measure for a number of reasons. Obviously, inequality is perpetuated by so many numerous social and commercial variables that it's hard to disaggregate what is the impact of philanthropic giving itself and to extract that from other causes. So it's something that's very hard to determine in a causative way. How does that square with the fact that we've still got widening inequality? You can at least suggest a possible correlation between steady levels of philanthropy and increased inequality rather than say the reverse. Certainly philanthropy has not made a dent in narrowing wealth inequalities. Callahan did not see a clear link between economic inequality and philanthropy. However, political inequality is a different thing. It's about who, whose voice is heard in the public square, who gets to shape the collective direction of our society. And I do think that this rising era of big philanthropy and all of the activists giving through policy organizations uh, is helping exacerbate that, that civic inequality that, that we have and that that problem is getting worse. But for McGoy, it's not just the increased amount of philanthropic money or influence in the public sphere that's alarming, but it's the relationship between philanthropic organizations and for-profit corporations. The new trend, the new belief that private companies should be seen as deserving charity recipients is, I think, the, what's new is just the sheer magnitude of the gifts that are going to some of these corporations, such as the Gates Foundation's donation of $11 million to MasterCard to set up a lab for financial inclusion in Nairobi. I think it's highly worrying, A, because companies themselves are in many ways contracting their own philanthropic disbursements. B, it's fallen a bit in the past year, but in 2015, corporate profitability was at an all-time high in the U.S for the past 60 years, so it had reached a 60-year peak. C, we've got growing inequality in the United States, as well as widening gaps between wealthy nations and poor ones, and we have to address the fact, or at least consider the, fact, the problem of whether or not this rise in horizontal giving, the rich giving directly to wealthy corporations, is really a welcome development or not. You know, and she also pointed out that this kind of giving is part of a larger trend, and it's, and it's taken scholars by surprise, really. Uh, it raised concerns, both ethical and legal. A lot of philanthropy scholars in the U.S. have been really taken aback and very, very surprised by the news, by the realization that the Gates Foundation is giving directly to a company like MasterCard. And this grant to MasterCard, it's not going to the foundation arm of MasterCard. It's going to the corporate entity itself in a way that helps the company to offset some of its liabilities for setting up new firms and expanding its operations in Africa. So it's going to the corporation, and it's a way that helps the corporation to reduce its own overheads in a way that's clearly profitable for MasterCard shareholders. So this money is... I would argue, being used to expand private assets to reap private profit. Now, technically, that is meant to be in breach of 501c3 regulations, which suggests that philanthropic giving should not be used to help what's called the private inurement of an individual. So there is some question surrounding what whether or not gifts to MasterCard might breach 501c3 regulations. What the Gates Foundation has stated and what it stated to me in an email, what it stated publicly, is that it, its giving to corporations is in line 
with a stipulation within regulations that govern philanthropic bodies that indicate, yes, you can give to a for-profit entity, but only if the gift giving is used for non-commercial means, only if it's used for in a manner that does not expand private gain for individuals, and only if it's in line with your charitable mission. And the Gates Foundation indicates that it's compliant with this regulation. But I think this needs more scrutiny because I simply cannot see how a grant to MasterCard doesn't expand private profits for shareholders. What it seems like to me is that philanthropy essentially is redirecting what were once public goods into private hands. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, it's twofold. A, there's the fact that a very tiny minority is influencing public policy and decisions. But then B, they're also wielding this influence with dollars that should be subject to taxation, therefore under democratic control. I mean, there's studies that indicate that nearly $50 billion each year escapes the public coffers because philanthropic donations are tax exempt. We have to raise the question, couldn't these dollars be used better if subjected to public scrutiny? Yeah, you raise a crucial point. What does increased philanthropy mean for democracy itself? Actually, I was able to pose that exact question to Professor Mogoy. I think that's a great question. I'm curious to find out. I'm worried. <laughs> and where I think this new trend of giving to corporations is going is it's simply consolidating elite power, okay? So when you have a grant going to a company like MasterCard, a company that buys in and subscribes to the general trend of paying its own executives a highly, highly inflated CEO pay of, say, five or six million each year. So a company will make that own internal division of dividends choice. It chooses to pay its executives millions of dollars, and then it is able to position itself somehow as a deserving charity claimant when it comes with its begging basket to an organization like the Gates Foundation, which gladly says, hey, yeah, you're a big multinational. We'll help you expand in Africa, and we'll call it charity. Well, I think the fact that that is now seen as legally permissible, whether or not it breaches 501c3 regulations or not, is highly worrying because it means that you have this consolidation of wealth concentration and power in incredibly exclusive organizations, which have not been shown to benefit the least marginalized earlier times. So why should we trust corporations to necessarily do the right thing now? What makes corporations listen are things like collective bargaining rights, regulatory power, being kept in check by democratically elected officials. So it's not that corporations are in any way necessarily inherently nefarious, but their primary responsibility is to their own shareholders so they have a primary responsibility to expand profit even when it comes at the cost of things like environmental welfare or benefits provision or decent pay. So we're, we're in some ways restricting the space for curtailing the power of corporations when we're actually giving them philanthropic gifts directly that they never have to pay back. MasterCard, no matter how profitable this lab for financial inclusion becomes in Nairobi that the Gates Foundation money was going to develop. No matter how profitable that becomes, MasterCard is not legally obligated to pay it back. When it comes to philanthropy, it's not so much the ends that you should judge or the political affiliations of the donors themselves, but rather the means. That is, the process and the structure of a tiny minority with such great influence on the decisions being made that affect our public lives. That's a great point. And the other so, thing with the so the constant uh, you know, criticism of the Cokes what, with, matched with a lot of support for the more left-leaning donors is that you're actually undermining your own ability to criticize the Cokes when you refuse to ever engage critically with those on the left. You need a rule of law that applies equally to funders of different ideological stripes. So those who can't stand the Cokes, unfortunately, need to recognize that the unrestrained freedom of a body like the Gates Foundation to do whatever it likes is what legitimates the Koch brothers to fund even worse causes. David Callahan agreed. A lot of people on the left worry about what the right is doing. 
uh, with the Koch brothers and other donors. I think it's all scary, but uh, people tend to be quite selective in terms of what they're complaining about. And we have a perfect example here. Uh, we were also able to talk to the executive producer of Workers Independent News uh, based out in Madison, Wisconsin. Hi, my name is Frank Emspach. I'm the executive producer of Workers Independent News. Mr. Emspach elaborated on how even progressive news organizations have been affected throughout the years by philanthropic dollars. In the last few years, there has been a big change in the way philanthropy relates to social organizations. Recently, I was at the Media Consortium Conference and was struck by what I believe to be a huge shift in the relationship between philanthropy and social movements. In the 1970s, the alternative press, all these little newspapers that grew up, uh, community radio, and even video or things like the Liberation News Service were financed primarily by participants in the social movements of the time, that is individuals giving small amounts or organizations that they uh, had organized uh, actually sponsoring the papers or the videos or the news service. Today, what we see in the sort of progressive uh, activist media world, what we see are the foundations as the major source of income for many, many of these publications. And even if it's not the major source or the majority income, it's enough so that these publications uh, and might not survive without it. And that is a big, big change in the dynamic between a membership-driven, perhaps, or a social movement-driven media and a foundation or philanthropy-driven media. And this really gets to the point that the only way to effectively change this current state of affairs is for people to realize that power lies in numbers, a power that these wealthy individuals lack and are actively compensating with dollars. Absolutely. What real structural change actually requires is organizing on a mass scale to pressure our governments, who unlike these wealthy donors are actually beholden to the interests of the public, to make public policy decisions that benefit the masses. And until we come to this realization, philanthropy will continue to make the decisions that in any real democracy would be left to the people. So thanks for joining us for our fourth episode of Left Out. If you like what you heard, check us out by visiting democracyatwork.info, click on the media page where you'll find Left Out and all of our past episodes. Or you can subscribe to the feed on iTunes, Google Play, Podbean, pretty much any one of your podcast platforms. Please as well, if you're on Facebook, uh, check us out at our Democracy at Work page, give us a like. And uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Democracy at Work, for content like this. Just want to give some thank yous. Uh, first and foremost, Bloomfield College's uh, Creative Arts and Technology Department. Especially Toriano Gandhi um, and our audio engineers, Anthony Corbo and of course, Corey Morgar. Also, the intro music was written, recorded and produced by our sound engineer, Corey Morgart. Shout out. And the outro music is done by Cy Adler, titled, This City's Wonderful. And um, definitely thanks to uh, our, um, our episode interviewees today, David Callahan, Lindsay McGowie, and Frank M. Speck. This was Left Out. Yes, this city is wonderful if you have dough, but if you don't, it's no.